I'm going to be honest as I open this video up, and, and I know that's a, a usual track that I take opening up, especially these recap and reaction videos, but bear with me for just one second, if you will. I've had an incredibly hard time getting a read on most of the Big Ten teams this season. And maybe that's my fault. Maybe I'm not doing enough work or putting enough effort into this channel, and maybe I need to get better at that. But with the crazy amount of parody that we've seen and just a tumultuous level of up and downness, I guess for lack of a better term, the tumultuous nature of college football this season in general has left me somewhat befuddled. And I thought, I thought that that really only applied to relatively more to the middle of the pack to lower tier Big Ten teams in which it seems like in any given week this season, a Washington you know, can can beat a Michigan, but then an Iowa can beat a Washington, but then a Michigan State can beat an Iowa, but then lose to Michigan, making it all, well, really difficult to suss out what kind of the middle of the tier teams in the Big Ten are up to and where they'll fall in, you know, the ultimate hierarchy of things in this conference as the season progresses. But I didn't think that would be true for Ohio State. I didn't think it would be true for Ohio State, the team with undoubtedly the best roster in all of college football, in my opinion. And that's borne out in the stats. It's borne out in our own TTI metric, which is a part of our DPI, which is a part of our, you know, our version of blue chip ratio, as we always say on this channel. That's borne out in what they've done in recruiting recent years and in the transfer portal. I didn't think that they would be a team at this point in the season that we would have to have this frank and honest conversation about. Ohio State has finally entered the more challenging part of their schedule after play, playing basically nobody in the non-conference in a, in a you know middle to lower tier team in Michigan State. And now they've lost, albeit on the road, and to one of the best teams, if not the best team in the entire country in the Oregon Ducks, a team that we'll be talking about more in depth this week, by the way. Which could have, which was excusable, right? And especially in the way in which that 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 game went down in the final seconds, many Ohio State fans bewildered and beleaguered by that final result. But I don't think many people expected a Nebraska team, a middle of the pack Big Ten team that, by the way, just got blown out by forty nine points to Kurt Signetti's Indiana Hoosiers to come into the shoe and play as competitive of a game with the Buckeyes as they did yesterday. And if you're an Ohio State fan today, you have to be scratching your head and wondering what exactly went down in that game. I watched it in real time. It was one of the few games I got to watch in real time this weekend as once again I had family things and other things going on in the background in my life here. So I try to find a healthy work slash hobby balance with life, but that's that's my own personal stuff there, I guess. But there was one phrase as I was watching this game that I kept thinking of, and I kept getting reminded of, that Ryan Day goes back on time and time again, and that is leave no doubt. Leave no doubt, as in not only win the game, but win the game in a convincing fashion. That seems to be the standard that he as the head coach has set for this team and the expectation, therefore, that this team has of themselves. Leave no doubt. And I want to go back real quickly. And by the way, we will be getting into the stats and diving into the weeds in this game against the Nebraska Cornhuskers for the Ohio State Buckeyes. You can like this, share it around, and subscribe and all that good stuff. But we did, we did a video a while back about Ohio State. And we talked about pressure. And we talked about pressure being a good thing sometimes. And especially, you know, self-imposed pressure. I don't think anyone in life really gets anywhere without some self-imposed pressure, right? A little bit of it can be a good thing, at least. I put pressure on myself to come up with, you know, pleasant enough looking graphics. I think I do a decent enough job, though I, I don't exactly have a degree in, you know, arts or 
in graphic arts. But I think I do fairly well enough. But I put pressure on myself to give you guys good content. But if that pressure is too much, if I hold myself to too high of a standard, I know, well, I'll start to crumble, right? If you're, if you're too self-critical, then you're bound to make mistakes that you see as being critical mistakes. And you're bound to hold yourself to perfection, which is not something that any person, let alone an entire, you know, 75 to 100 man college football roster can be capable of. And Ryan Day says, leave no doubt. And I ask, what about just winning all your games? Because it seems as if we may have a case of a coach and a team putting themselves in a bind and putting themselves under too much pressure. And the weight of that pressure may be caving in. But I don't want to open this up really with, and I know this is a very long intro and bear with me here. I don't want to open this up with too much negativity either. And again, for full disclosure, I am a Michigan fan doing my best to look at this program in an unbiased fashion. Sometimes it's good to peel back a little bit and take a more, you know, nuanced 30,000 foot view on any given college football program. Sometimes as fans especially, whether we be rival fans or fans of the team themselves, we have a tendency to overreact. And while it's my nature to sit here and overreact and think that this is a sign of cracks in the foundation for the Ohio State Buckeyes, let's think for a second about how several teams in the past, in the past few years, have had these kinds of games. No college football team, be it as great as they are, goes through a season without some struggles, without some adversity. And maybe it was my mistake as a college football content creator, and maybe it was a mistake of a lot of us to just assume that Ohio State was going to blow through their schedule. But need I remind you, once again, there are teams out there, great teams, that struggle. In 2021, Michigan struggled to beat Nebraska on the road before ultimately end up ending up in the Final Four, quote-unquote, the college football playoff. And Alabama last season nearly lost to Auburn, needing a miracle 4th and 31, something like that, touchdown play. And in any given season, Georgia has survived, quote-unquote, in the past few years, tests of other teams in the SEC to make it to where they've been, and so on and so forth. You know, Oregon this season struggled for three quarters against Idaho. Idaho. And again, it brings us back to the parity of college football. So I don't want to overreact here. I don't want to act like this is Ohio State, you know, the house of cards falling down on Ryan Day's head or anything like that, because it's one bad game. And I think it would, it's a bad game by Ohio State standards. You know, part of the reason why I love college football is the fact that sometimes wins can feel like losses, right? And again, we go back to standards. Ohio State came into this game first in SP plus overall, eighth in SP plus offense, and first in the entire country in Bill Connolly's SP plus defensive metric. Rushing the football, they were averaging over six yards per rush. They had one of the best rushing attacks in the entire country. And they were up against a Nebraska team that is 32nd, well, was 32nd overall in SP plus outside of the top 25. And they were 86th, 86th. To put that into context, that's 20 points, 20 places below Michigan's dreadful offense in SP plus offense, but yet they were seventh in SP plus defense with one, one good unit. Nebraska was able to keep this game close and Ohio state by all intents and purposes was expected to blow Nebraska out in this one. But yet again, parody in college football rears its ugly head and we have a closer game than many of us expected. Just to get deeper into the stats here and kind of fully explain what happened in this game, which I would assume is why most of you are here. You're not here to hear me rant at large, but again, like, share, and subscribe, and we appreciate all of our new subscribers' support and all of you commenting out there and watching the live streams. And by the way, you can join the Discord if you want, so you can call in on my live call-in shows every Monday night. That'd be greatly appreciated. But again, I digress with all that stuff as usual. (laughs) 
yeah, one of those in this video at least. But looking at the individual stats here, what we're going to do here is we're going to go over the individual stats and talk about individual performances and then overall team performances. And I'm also going to give you guys a few key plays that I think decided this game because I had my kind of real-time takes. You know, I was befuddled, like I said, and then I had to kind of go back. If I'm befuddled by something, if something confuses me, if something confounds me, I'm going to dive into the stats, and I'm going to dive into the kind of the play-by-play -play stuff and, you know, all that all that nerdy numbers-crunching stuff that you all probably come here for. And I'm going to try to figure out my best as to how this game went down. And to my best explanation, really, outside of a few key plays that a lot of them ended up going Ohio State's way, Nebraska... Again, 32nd in SP Plus outside of the top 25 in Bill Connolly's metric with the 86th ranked SP Plus offense. Played Ohio State evenly. And the thing that jumps out of the off the board in the individual statistics, most of all, if you haven't seen it already, as you're kind of looking at this graphic, focus on Ohio State's rushing. Ohio State didn't have a single running back in this game, a single runner with a carry over 15 yards after what they were able to do so far this season. And even against Oregon, even against Oregon, a team who was in the top 20 in SP Plus defense themselves, they were able to rip off a few big runs with Travion Henderson. On the road, by the way, this was a home game. And I don't think that should, I don't think that can be overstated. Ohio State was at home in this one, in the shoe, one of the more difficult places to play for a road opponent. And Nebraska holds Ohio State to, yes, 31 carries for 64 yards and a 2.1 yards per carry average. Now, I know there were some sacks on Will Howard that factor into that, but it still wouldn't have been that great without the sacks. Quinshawn Judkins with 10 carries for 28 or 29 yards, a 2.9 average, so yeah, 29 yards and a long of just seven after what he's done so far this season. Travion Henderson, not much better. 10 for 25 or 2.5, and a long of just 15. And the running quarterback, Will Howard, well, he averages 1.8 yards per carry. But again, it's almost like with the negatives, you can also see the positives, right? Because Nebraska, again, a very good defense and a good defensive front that doesn't get talked about enough with pretty good linebackers. And by the way, decently good safeties that often crash down and, you know, help fill in run gaps. And that's that's been all the difference for them, I would say, in run defense so far this season, watching them on film. Nebraska took away the thing that Ohio State does best. And one thing in the positive category, I would say for Ohio State in this game is that you needed to rely on Will Howard in order to win this game. And Will Howard comes out and goes 13 of 16 for 221 yards with an average, an average of 13.8 yards per attempt with three touchdowns to one interception. Now I'm blanking on exactly how the interception went down, but two of those three touchdowns were two of the three plays in the game I just mentioned a minute ago. Two of the few plays in the game, I should say, because it was more than three. It was, it was a few more than that. But without the 40-yard touchdown to Carnell Tate, which was an absolute dot, by Will Howard, and a 60-yard touchdown to Jeremiah Smith, which similarly was also a dot right on the money, Ohio State doesn't win this game. And maybe maybe that's the positive. Maybe if you want to go full glass, half full from this game, you still won, and at the end of the day, that's all that counts. This is still a win for the Ohio State Buckeyes, and I'm not going to sit here and say that they still can't achieve all of their goals, because they most definitely can. Again, think of that 2021 Michigan team. Think of that 2022 Michigan team that needed a field goal to be Illinois. Think of the 2023 Michigan team that had struggled at times, you know, down the line in their regular season. Or that Alabama-Auburn game like I talked about. Or Georgia struggling at times. And they're, every good, great team has a few games where they just don't play like themselves. I think that might just be the case for Ohio State. And again, the glass half full thing here is Will Howard did what you were hoping that Will Howard was capable of doing, which is hitting shots downfield, which opens up the offense even more. But we got to get back, unfortunately, to some negatives here as well. Because there were some miscues in this game by Ohio State too. 
obviously. That's that's the reason why this game ended up being so close, right? Because if, if Ohio State plays their best game, well, this is Indiana versus Nebraska 2.0. But that wasn't what happened. A failed fourth down in the first quarter, quarter excuse me, in Nebraska territory, allowing a 38-yard run by Dylan Rayola, a man who is a bit of a runner, can run a little bit, but isn't, you know, Denard Robinson out here. A missed field goal, and we have to get to the offensive line, which ultimately not only did not play particularly well in this game, but your starting left tackle, who was replacing your initial starting left tackle, who is now out for an extended period of time, went down, and shuffling along the offensive line led to the rushing stats we see above. Which, by the way, that left side of the offensive line was the best part of this offensive line, and now... Is it even better than that right side, which was the weak point before with Josh Fryer in them? Again, outside of the 40-yard touchdown to Tate and the 60-yard touchdown to Smith, both really great throws by Will Howard, Ohio State doesn't win this game. And it's glaring, too. When you look up there at Dylan Rayola's stats, that was almost a winning performance against an Ohio State defense. 21 of 32 for 152 yards, just a 4.8 yards per attempt average, and an interception with no touchdowns, a 69.7 QBR. That was nearly a winning performance, and had it not been for some offensive pass interference calls that I thought were a little ticky-tack against Jamar Banks and Isaiah Nayor, who both had decent games, well, subpar games, I want to look at their individual stats. I'm assuming... I, I have it stuck in my brain that some of those offensive pass interference catches were still great catches, I guess. They were great plays that were just called back. But it's it's the fine margins that happen when parity is existent in college football like this. Nebraska isn't a bad team. Ohio State is perceived as a great team. But when you know you have a Big Ten conference that, I hate to admit it, Ohio State fans, is, is full of good coaches, good to great coaches like Matt Rule, and decent rosters with five-star quarterbacks now. You look around this league, and there's great coaches everywhere. You know, Jed Fish at Washington. Matt Rule at Nebraska. T.J. Fleck at Minnesota. Burt at Illinois. These are good coaches who put together good game plans and good teams. And if you play sloppy, in any given week, they can get you. And it almost happened here. And I'm going to get to the overall team stats here because I don't want this one to get too long. This is already almost 20 minutes long. Of course, you guys know how much I love college football and I love talking about it. By the way, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe and all that good stuff. Speaking of, having a good game plan includes knowing what you can do on third down. And Chip Kelly, boy howdy. I say boy howdy a lot. By the way, that's a reference to my favorite podcaster. If you guys can figure it out, who my favorite podcaster is, let me know in the comments. That's a little challenge for you. One of 10 on third down. And it wasn't just being stuck in third and long. You know, sometimes a team will do really bad on third down and it's because they were bad on second down, which led to a lot of third and longs, which obviously led to more failed third down attempts. There were several, several instances of third and two and third and one where Ohio State called a little power play or called a, a, a stretch play or a zone run like they usually do inside zone or et cetera, et cetera. And they got absolutely stuffed by, again, a good Nebraska defense. But we have to say, and this will get, you know, tease you guys a little bit for the next slide as we look ahead to the schedule coming up. Nebraska is not the best defensive line you're going to see for the rest of the season. So is that panic worthy? Again, it's glass half full, glass half empty, right? Because Will Howard stepped up and did what he needed to do in spite of poor rushing plays on third down and poor rushing in general. So I really, I really want Ohio State fans to let me know in the comments exactly how you see it. Because I honestly don't know exactly what lens to view this game through. Honestly, again, I was rather befuddled. In turnovers, it was pretty even. Each team threw an interception. But the rushing battle, again, against the 86th 
SP plus offense in the country, you lost the rushing battle. 86th sub par. Less than average. There are 134 FBS teams. You can do the math. I'm sure you can. Now, they gave up just 3.7 yards per rush, and 38 of those yards came on a Dylan Rayola scramble. But even if you took away that those 38 yards, you're still losing the rushing battle. And in time of possession, Nebraska held onto the ball for much longer. So efficiently scoring was really Ohio State's only way, and they were able to do it in this one. Again, the two big touchdown throws made all the difference, in my opinion. And Nebraska, of course, having the ball at the end of the game with a chance and absolutely, you know, I hate to be this frank, but pissing away, pissing it away, and Nebraska fans are going to hate hearing me say this, but pissing it away in typical Nebraska fashion. What's the record in one-score games again now? Matt Rule seems to be doing a lot of things early in his tenure here, similar to other Nebraska coaches to just talk about Nebraska for a second. How big of a win would this have been for Matt Rule in Nebraska, by the way? To have the ball with, what was it, three, three and a half minutes left and take it down to the two-minute warning and you're thinking this is good, they're going to make sure this is the last drive of the game, they're going to put the game in Dylan Rayola's hands and maybe he can do something. And well, as we say on the channel, Nebraska, Nebraska. But just to finish this up and just to get back on Ohio State, this is an interesting dynamic now. This is an interesting spot that Ohio State finds itself in because, again, the schedule has ramped up. You just struggled, and I think struggled is the right word, as much as some Ohio State fans out there might, might like to defend the fact that they still came away in this game and this is somehow a big win, even though, again, it was against the 86th-ranked SP Plus offensive team. The schedule's ramping up here, and again, Nebraska held you to what they held you in terms of running on the ground in your own stadium, and don't look now, but you have to play what I would say is a better defensive front in Penn State this next week. We'll see what the the condition of Drew Aller is, by the way, for that one. I'll probably come out with a preview and prediction video for that one where we'll talk about it more in depth. But just talking about what you weren't able to do in this game and the prospects of being able to, the prospects of potentially struggling again while well, they're there. And now we have to look at a scenario where Penn State beats you in their home stadium for the first time in, since 2016. I'm going to say it right now. I think it may happen because if Ohio State especially, and I think Ohio State fans would agree with me, if you play the kind of game you played this past weekend against that Penn State team on the road, with or without Drew Aller, by the way, Andy Kotelnecki is drawing up a hella great scheme for that Penn State offense so far this season. I think you could lose that one. And yes, Purdue and Northwestern we won't really talk about because those should be just about guaranteed wins for your program. But then you head back into the shoe and you play an Indiana team that isn't what a lot of people think they are. I've gotten a chance to watch some Indiana film of Kurt Signetti's, some film on Kurt Signetti's team. That is a complete team. By the way, in terms of the rushing battle and the potential for Ohio State to collapse on the ground in that one, last I checked, and it may have been updated now, I'm going to admit because they played a game since last time I've seen it, they were fourth in the entire country in rush, yards per rush allowed. Again, Indiana isn't just a team with a great offense or just a team carried by a great quarterback or just a team with some generational talent at one position that carries the team. That's a complete team over there that you have to bring your A game against with a good defense. 30th and SP plus last time I checked. And oh, by the way, they're averaging 40-something points per game offensively. And then you play the Michigan Wolverines. And in Michigan, I'll admit, as a Michigan fan myself, it's a it's a it's a 90-10 likelihood, in my opinion, right now that Ohio State wins that game. But if you play a game like this, like you just did against Nebraska, against that defense, and don't look now, but Michigan with this two quarterback system that they're running, and we'll see if it's really figured out or not. But they were able to beat Michigan State last night. Well, what 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 do you think if 
Ohio State ends up in another close game against the dreadful, the dreaded Michigan Wolverines. You know, the cheaters, they cheated. I'm sure I'll get a lot of comments on that as I speak. But regardless, like, share, and subscribe, even if you're an Ohio State fan. I feel like we're being pretty objective here, but you can tell me if I'm wrong in the comments, of course. And jump in the Discord and tell me personally if you want. If you play a game this past weekend, like the one you did this past weekend, and Michigan brings their A game, I'm telling you right now it could be close. And Michigan in the past three contests have won close-ish games against Ohio State. There, I left the door wide open for a bunch of Connor Stallion's comments. But go off in the comments, Buckeye scoop people. Anyway, that's my video covering Ohio State's loss. Loss. <laughs> Ohio State's victory against Nebraska. I did a little Freudian slip there, didn't I? Because, again, sometimes in college football, wins can feel like losses, can't they? But, again, it still counts. And we'll see how Ohio State responds. Because, again, there are plenty of great teams, just to leave on a positive note here, that have these kinds of games and still achieve all their goals. And Ohio State's goals are still in front of them. But boy, howdy, do they need to get it right this week before facing the Penn State Nittany Lions in Happy Valley. That's going to do it for this video, of course. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe and all that good stuff. Don't forget also to check out our sponsor, GreenGridiron.com. The link is in the comments. And when you check out, you can use promo code DTB, something special they set up just for DTB listeners to get 10% off your next college football decorative helmet purchase over there at GreenGridiron.com. I'll be back live tomorrow night at 7 p.m. so you can tell me all about how Michigan only won because of Connor Stallions in the comments over there live and I will also be hosting Big Ten Live at the Voice of College Football Monday night, later on Monday night, as I always do, over on Mark Rogers' channel, The Voice of College Football. So feel free to check that all out. And once again, before I go, I have to remind you guys, be kind to other people out there. <laughs>